We are in Luke 21, and for those of you who have been on the journey uh, with us, uh, the story of Jesus is, is truly an amazing story. Most people, unfortunately, those who really don't, I'm going to say it, pay attention to the scriptures, uh, just see it as a bunch of uh, uh, great stories that we we have great Sunday school stories today. It's a story about Jesus. Oh, yay, yay. And today's story is, in a sense, one of the last stories, uh, as far as stories go, on Jesus just ministering. Uh, and it's an observation he makes in chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, of something that happened in the temple that's kind of like, uh, a blip on the radar that blips once and then it's gone and if Luke uh, actually Luke and Mark both record it uh, if they hadn't recorded it it would have just gone unnoticed for all eternity because it's about a nobody doing in essence a nothing and yet we have this uh, Jesus perspective on it that tilts the whole thing on its ear which is why, in a sense, uh, I'm not saying it's the only reason I asked for if there was testimonies. Uh, what, what great thing happened this week? Well, let's see. The car started. Uh, I had breakfast. Then I also had lunch. Oh, I also had dinner. Whoa, thank you, Lord. Let's see, what else? I uh, was able to pay my bills. Yes! Are those, are those big? <clears throat> Oh, when it gets down to it, yeah, they're huge. But we tend to miss them because they weren't like Aunt Matilda who was on her deathbed phoned me and said, yeah, I just woke up one day and I'm all healed. Whoa, that's huge. Well, so is you waking up, putting your feet on the floor and actually having the ability to feel how cold the floor is. Did you ever thank God for that? So we have this story. And it begins with, and he looked up, or as the participle would say, and upon looking up, he saw. So we, as we saw in all of chapter 20, he's in the temple. Um, and from the end of chapter 19, he's, he's in the temple. He, he's shown up on Monday and he drove out those, I'm not going to go back on that, uh, but he's in the temple, and then there's all these quote-unquote interviews. And we know what kind of lying, cheating, murderous, malicious, hateful encounters these were. Trying to get Jesus' goat, trying to, uh, uh, what's the word, make him look bad in front of all the people. And you know how that worked out. He made all the uppity-ups look bad. And it made him so angry, they wanted to grab hold of him, and they couldn't. Because what? They were cowards. They hid behind their robes and their prestige and their power, but they were cowards. Because if he was really the charlatan that they thought he was, they believed him to be, they would not have been afraid of the crowds. They would have done what was right to the glory of God. But instead, because none of that was true anyway, it was only their murderous worldview that set everything on its ear as far as their belief in Jesus and who he was. They were made to look like fools. And then he talks about them. And they know he's talking about them. And they're the ones that are going to kill him. We had all of that. And what we're doing, what Luke is doing here at the end, or the beginning of, of uh, chapter 21, the end of the temple experience, the end of Monday and Tuesday are kind of wedded. Uh, so there is no delineation in Luke on what happened on Monday and what happened on Tuesday. But this is approaching now the end of Tuesday. His time in the temple on Tuesday. I, I hope you understand why I'm saying Tuesday. Uh, I'll tell you this, because Wednesday we don't know what happened. He probably, if you stop and think about what's going to happen on Thursday with 
the Last Supper, the Upper Room experience, and the revelation of uh, Judas as being the guy who's going to stab him in the back as a traitor. And then what happens after that when they go to the garden and they pray. And then what happens after that with Judas shows up, kisses him on the cheek, and everybody shows up to haul him off. And so he has uh, seven, five, I can't remember how many trials, lots. Um, five trials that night, all of them illegal. And in the morning, Friday morning, he is convicted of being who he is. They convicted him of saying he was the Messiah, the Son of God, and crucified. So that's Friday. Thursday, Wednesday, this is Tuesday. So it's all coming to an end. And that's what makes it even more poignant, is that this is a nothing story. Upon looking up, he saw. So he's in the temple. Uh, according to Mark, he's, he's seated in a, uh, in a spot where he can watch uh, who comes by. Because they come by, they drop their... Uh, it's, it's a little difficult with what the word is. The word is uh, uh, dora, not dora, dora. And it's a gift or an offering. And sometimes uh, in other churches, uh, we're going to pray uh, for uh, God will bless your tithes and offerings. Your tithes, in a sense, are the first fruits of what you earn. Those belong to God because he gave you the ability to earn. The offerings are... Whatever. Uh, you know, I've got, shoot, I've got more money in my pocket. I'm good, so here. Um, so when it says dora, it's offering, uh, or it's a, it's a gift, but it can also be an offering. It can also be a gift. So whatever they were putting in, people were dropping in their coin uh, for God's work. So he looks up, and it sounds almost accidental, but I'm going to say this, because uh, several of you understand and will connect with divine appointments. Why were you at Vaughn's on Monday? You never go shopping on Monday, but you found yourself at Vaughn's on Monday, and that's when you came across this person whom you never would have met. Divine appointment. Yesterday on the way home, we got hungry, so we stopped in Kettleman City, and uh, you know, if you've been to Kettleman City, Jack in the Box is here, and Taco Bell is, is there, and as Kathy and I were eating, I looked at her and said, is this the spot where we met uh, Cian and Andy? Or was it, she said, no, it was Taco Bell. Here we were at Taco Bell, just getting our food. Wayne? Kathy? Actually, they said Kathy. And I thought, well, Kathy, how many Kathys are there in the world? Lots. So I didn't pay any attention. All of a sudden, this woman is talking to Kathy. And uh, so I placed my order and turned. And here it is, one of our former camp kids from 20 years previous who had moved out of state. And here we are. She's talking to my wife. I see her, seeing, and then she brings me over. We had never met her husband, Andy. Uh, they've been here, by the way. Andy, seeing. <laughs> and so we sat with them and had lunch, and they introduced us to a, uh, a girl named Morgan who helped us at camp, and then her little brother eventually came, and now he helps Dean. It's what you call a divine appointment. The right time. Do you think Jesus was just sitting there, no, you know what, yeah, I probably ought to leave pretty soon because nothing's going to happen today. So we look at this, and now on looking up, he saw those throwing their gifts into the treasury. And these people were rich. 
And by the way, the word is really difficult. You'll notice that I, I translated it as the ones depositing their money. Um, the word actually comes from the, uh, from the word for throw, uh, from which we get our word bal. It's balo. Uh, throwing their money into, I just threw a nickel. I just, that was my illustration for a little later on. Oh, oh. You know it's there. Um, these people were coming by, and it's like he's sitting there, and keep in mind, if he knows your name from before the foundation of the world, do you think he doesn't know what's going on? Of course he knows what's going on. So he's sitting there watching the rich throw their, by the way, it's been a long time since we've heard it, but do you know the sound of silver as, a point, as opposed to the junk we've got now? Have you heard silver coins clang? It's a totally different sound than the junk we've got now. So you can imagine, especially if there's gold coins in there, the sound. And you know the sound. And that's what's going in. Clink, 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 clink. Clink, 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 clink. Clink, clink, clink. Not just like that. So that's what's happening in verse 1. Divine appointment. Um... Verse 2, then, or moreover, or now, or and, he saw a widow, a poor widow, that would, uh, Lenski's translation is a penniless widow, because that's the whole concept. This woman is on the, this close to beggarliness. A penniless widow throwing in their two left. Okay, I am going to get my nickel. Okay, and I only have a nickel because I didn't, I looked on my change thing and I didn't have any pennies. So, here's a nickel. Now, if I put this in Park Hill Community Church's uh, offering plate, can you guess how many hours of electricity this will pay for? Um, let's see, what else? Uh, uh, how, how much of the uh, uh, housekeeper, custodian, uh, this will pay for? Do you know how much this will pay for at Park Hill Community Church? Honestly, it's not even worth Tammy's time to handle it and to mark it on what goes in as a deposit. It's not. That's what this is. Two leptas? is 160, one is 164th of a denarius. A denarius is a day's wage. And it's hard to say what that is today when they want to make the minimum wage more than I ever earned. So, I don't know. Um, so I don't even know what, this, what to say the two leptas is worth, but at 164th of a day's wage, uh, what are you going to buy with that? Well, you'd be able to buy... Maybe a sparrow. This whole thing reminds me of, remember Elijah's story? Uh, God took him from where the ravens and the brook had fed him, and then the brook dried up. And uh, so God said, hey, I want you to go up to Zarephath. There's going to be a widow there. I want you to talk to her, and, and you can stay with her. And so he meets her. Divine appointment. He meets her, and she's going to gather wood so she can make one more meal so that she then, her and her son, can die. Because that's, that's it. There is no more. No more anywhere. This reminds me of that story. And you wonder, first of all, how Jesus knew she was a widow. Uh, and I would say he knew she was a widow because she was wearing a, a wedding ring and her husband wasn't there. But... If this was her two lepta, she wouldn't have a wedding ring because she would have already sold that uh, in order to eat. So how did he know? All I'm going to say is that Jesus is Jesus, and he knows. If that works for you, I have no problem with it. So he saw a penniless widow throwing in, I'm going to say depositing, in that place, the same place as all the rich, clinkety-clinkety-clink, clankety-clinkety-clink, ding. Two lepta. 
So Mark tells us that he calls the disciples together. And I'm thinking that they were kind of strategically gathered around in the temple, kind of doing this, uh, you know, watching out for Jesus, watching out for uh, what fool wants to come and uh, try to belittle himself in front of Jesus. And, but Mark tells us he calls them to him. And he said, Truly I tell you that this penniless widow threw in more than all. Okay. So, I don't know. Let's just say all of that was tithe. And every one of them earned uh, $10,000. So how much is in there? His 1,000, his 1,000, his 1,000, his 1,000, and she comes in with a lousy nickel. What does Jesus just tell us? He said, she has thrown in more than all. I don't get it. She threw in a nickel. How is that more than all? This is how it's more than all. For all of these, out of what abounds to them, or as I uh, translated it, from out of what is overflowing to them, their $1,000 gift was superfluous to them. They didn't need that $1,000 any more than you need an a Indian headdress. They don't need it. Superfluous. They have another thousand and another thousand and another thousand and another thousand on top of that. They don't need that thousand. I'm not even going to miss it. It's like out of my right hand, I just make sure everybody sees that it's a thousand. Okay. But apart from that, it's superfluous. And there's an ek here, which means out from or from out of. And it's from out of what is superfluous to them. That's how they gave. Yeah, I gave a thousand bucks. Big deal. But, he says, she, from out of her poverty, she deposited all the living which she had. What does Jesus have to say about her throwing in her nickel? Look at the last paragraph for those of you who have the notes. I'm going to read it. <clears throat> when this widow gave all the living she had, she gave herself completely into the hands of God. Her last act with the final bit of her living was an act of worship in true faith that now looked only unto God who cares for the destitute who trust in Him. What makes so many gifts so small? The fear that the giver, the givers, will not have enough for themselves. The thing about this little story, the last vignette before we get into the whole discussion on end times and then the whole um, story of how redemption took place, uh, the transition from <clears throat> standing upright, so to speak, to uh, being whatever this is, horizontal and vertical at the same time, uh, to them being horizontal in death, to them being vertical again in life. Um, this last little vignette, I believe Luke gives for two reasons. One is it's a contrast. Because in the previous chapter plus, that is 19 and 20, we found those who basically came up shaking their fist at Jesus. Who in the world do you think you are? Who gave you the right to do these things? Are you smart enough to answer our really sharp questions? 
we just want to drag you off to jails, but we're going to wait until these people go away. They're not going away, so we'll figure out another way. What do we have here? Without a single word, this woman takes her two little leptas and deposited all that she had to live on, just like Elijah's widow and her son, going to make one more meal with all that we have, and then we're just going to die. She's trusting God. This woman is trusting God. She's giving everything she has to God, because God is going to take care of her. Though, like Job says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So, the question as we close this uh, contrast, I said there was two things. One was the contrast to the pride and hypocrisy, and the widow's might showed a, what? A dependent heart, a humble heart, one that trusted God, one that looked at God and recognized by faith that God is God. No matter how much I have or don't have, God is God. The other is, I have everything. God doesn't, you know, I'm, I'm too good for Him, and so on and so forth. But the other thing is uh, to force us to ask, do we, do you trust God with what you have? Do you trust God with your wealth? Do you trust God with your possessions? And one of the things that I had, I was confronted with a long time ago, do you trust God even with your family? That is where, you know, my wealth, eh, my possessions, eh, my family, eh. But if you don't give your family to God, Just saying. So, as we leave these stories, and we leave the lessons that Luke is, lays out for us to be confronted with, I want you simply to ask yourself, do I have the heart of this beggarly widow who left herself in the hands of God, or am I much more careful? And I've got friends who don't know Jesus, and they're very careful. And they've got money, they could buy me out several times over, but man, are they careful. And every once in a while they give a gift to whatever, the Boy Scouts, the church even, and boy, they gave a hundred bucks. Yes! Sorry, there's nothing wrong with a hundred bucks, okay? Every month, if you didn't know, this church gives a hundred bucks to someone. Some entity or some individual. And uh, I have no problem with a hundred bucks. But knowing, as Jesus pointed out here, they could buy the place and they give a hundred bucks. It's like, yeah, you know what? I prefer not to know. <laughs> Just don't tell me. Any comments or questions before we move on to the next section, which is going to actually be a leader into uh, the book of Revelation? Not today, of course, and not even next week, but soon. Here we go. You look at verses 5 and 6, and while some were talking about the temple, Okay, so what is happening here? By the way, this serves as an introduction. I'm not going to do past verses 5 and 6 today because they literally serve as an introduction. And on your notes, you'll look at this odd title, The Illusion of Civilizations Enduring, and you're going, huh? What's that got to do with anything? Well, let me start with the scriptures, and then I'll hopefully connect with that. And while some were talking about the temple, uh, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, and then he says something. So in Mark and in Matthew, you can read those accounts. The, both of them have this verse. And what we find is there's motion. They're leaving the temple. And Jesus will not 
This is funny. Well, quote unquote funny. Jesus will not be back in the temple until he comes back to rule in the temple. So he's leaving the temple for, I'm just going to say, 2,000 years. He's leaving the temple. So they're leaving, and as they're leaving, you know, it's hard. Uh, when we were in Rome, when our daughter was uh, uh, over there for school for a year, we went and visited her, and we went to the Colosseum. And Kathy and, and Christine are standing over there going, and I was standing under one of those huge things, and I said, excuse me, let me just enjoy this, because I don't think I'm ever coming back to this place. And so I just sat, or stood, and looked at one of the huge things. And I enjoyed it. The point being that they're leaving this, and it's been a hard day, and for whatever motivation uh, it is, we find that the boys are admiring the temple of God. Now there's nothing wrong with that. At all. And you can see here, some were saying concerning the temple that it had been adorned with two things, beautiful stones and then votive offerings. Uh, having been adorned means that uh, as, as Herod was building this, and it, I'm trying to remember now how many years it was built. I think a total of 83 years this temple was being built, I think. I read that like last week and I didn't remember. So I think it was 83 years. And so it's already been being built for like uh, almost 50. And it's beautiful. And the stones it was adorned with, uh, they weren't just like, hey, let's go out here at Park Hill and pick up some rocks and put them in the uh, driveway so people won't uh, park in Lidbeck's parking spot. Lidbeck wouldn't either, would he? <laughs> No, these were, and when it says lithos, these are the stones that somebody took time to cut. All the angles are correct. They are square or rectangle, whatever. They're beautiful. They're beautiful. Now the votive things, that's a little, that's a little difficult. Um, wonderful stones and the buildings, it's a little difficult to know what these <clears throat> devoted things are. <clears throat> possibly, probably, the lavers, the lattices, some of the bricks, maybe some of the specific stones, some of the benches, some of the lights, the fixtures. Um, there's a church that Dean um, has uh, supervision of, and uh, everywhere you go, there's this bench is dedicated to so-and-so. This bench is dedicated in memorial of so-and-so. This, the bell tower is dedicated to such and such a family. These hymnals are, and on it goes. And the whole church was built upon memorials. Well, you can imagine if you want to get in good with the Sanhedrin, and you you know you have $1,000 to spare, good grief, you got several. So you're actually going to up it a little. And you're going to make sure that that labor, that whole labor, I did that. You ever heard anybody say, I did that? I'm sorry, I could lead you down a different path. We don't want to go there. Uh, these votive things are, are things that were superfluous to the, the actual function of the temple. They were things that would add something nice. Uh, just like at Park Hill, if we had heated seats, that would add something really nice, wouldn't it? Yes, it would, on a nice cold winter morning. So they, that is the boys, the, someone in the group, says, aren't these buildings gorgeous? <clears throat> Wonderful stones and buildings is what Mark tells us. Matthew tells us the temple buildings. Uh, Luke says not just the temple, but the stuff around the temple. Uh, it's the whole package deal. And between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we get the whole deal. The whole temple, the whole temple experience. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it wonderful? 
Now, the temple was more than just the function. Okay, I mean, it should be. The Park Hill Community Church, this functions for us. We come in, we sit down, uh, we interact, we, we sing, we pray, we, we give. Um, it, it's a function for us. But nobody, well, maybe somebody, would say that, land, uh, that Park Hill Community Church is a landmark. It's notable for its beauty. Uh, it might be noticeable because between the Cal Fire and us, there's nothing else, no other entities on the road uh, in our private. So uh, maybe for that reason, but the, the temple was for, for them and their thinking more than function. The temple was built to last for generations. Um, I haven't read the article yet, but there's I got a magazine at home that uh, deals with uh, Notre Dame, uh, the cathedral, which had a fire in 2019 and uh, had a lot of destruction. And what's interesting about that is is that we recognize in these cathedrals the uh, the builders. Uh, that is to say, the name, the guy, the architect, uh, the people that drew the pictures on the walls or painted them. But what happened after the fire was they discovered that each stone has a, a uh, stonemason's mark. So here's Bob Stone and Bob Stone and Bob Stone, and that took him a generation, so he's dead. There's Dean Stone and Dean Stone and Dean Stone, and he died, but his brother came up. That's Jake Stone, and that's Jake Stone, but he died. And so there's Paul Stone and Paul Stone, and on it goes. So what were these guys saying? And this gets us to the title, The Illusion of Civilization's Enduring. The temple is here, and God will be worshipped for generations and generations and generations in this spot. And Jesus has something to say. He says, these things which you observe, there will come days in which there shall not be left stone upon stone here, which will not be toppled down, which will not be thrown down, which will not be demolished, which will not be destroyed. So you kind of look at, if you've ever studied the Mayans or the Aztecs, they go out in the jungle and they find these ziggurats or temples and they were beautiful at the time but and they all died and they were all covered and disappeared so Jesus here I'm going to say um, <clears throat> Jesus says all this will be devastated all this will be destroyed and this opens, therefore, the conversation regarding the future. And for us, sitting in the year 2000, roughly speaking, from the year 30, roughly speaking, so roughly 2,000 year separation, Jesus was looking at the immediate, immediate future, that is 70 AD when Titus comes in. But we keep reading the chapter, both in Matthew and here in Luke and in Mark, and we see that there's more than just the immediate judgment of God upon Israel. There's something else. And so, as we uh, look in chapter 21, in the next several weeks, um, before we hit the next story again, in, in the redemptive story, um, <clears throat> we're going to uh, be exposed to not just the immediate future, 70 AD, but to our future, like 2022, 20, 2023, 20, when Jesus returns. So that's how we're introducing this. Coupled together, the last story where we're challenged by um, Luke with the story of the widow, and then we, we are leaving the temple. We're going to go to the Mount uh, Olivet, and there's going to be a Q&A there. And we'll get to that next week. You ready? <clears throat> Lord, 
I, I guess that question, are you ready? Um, uh, that's a question for today. Uh, Jesus has toppled all of men's excuses. Um, all of it. He's toppled all of our pride and our prejudice and our uh, power and our prestige. He's, he's toppled all of it. He's toppled all of our excuses. And uh, Lord, I just pray that as we consider the return of Jesus, the trumpet call, and then we're all removed, that we would continue to ask ourselves, are we ready? Are we ready to meet our maker? So go before us this week, Lord, as we uh, look for those opportunities just to praise you, uh, to realize that maybe our two nickels won't, uh, won't pay for the electricity at Park Hill, but they might benefit something uh, to the glory of God. So go before us and uh, guide and direct us until we meet again, once again, to give you glory. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen.